<laughs> Y'all, re regardless of your opinion of Logan Paul, you love him, you hate him, you're barely familiar with him. I don't know if you saw the news that broke right before today's show. Logan Paul got scammed for $3.5 million. So long story short, but I'll link to Logan's video down below if you want to see it in its full context. So you have this guy, Matt, he's a collector. He buys this case of Pokemon boxes for $2.7 million. He then sells that case to his buddy, Logan Paul, for $3.5 million. Then, and I have to wonder if he mentioned this to Logan before he sold it to him, in the video that Logan uploaded, that Matt says, The reason why I was mostly concerned was because the person who brought it to me, he had so many inconsistencies, so much inconsistencies in the stories. It was like three, four different stories. That was my issue. And while there were rumors that this could be fake, there was a belief that there was at least some level of trust here because the BBC E said, hey, this looks like a legitimate box. And so in Logan's video, they have someone come from the baseball card exchange to verify once again. And once they open this thing, they, they realize some things are off. They open one of the cases and they have packs of G.I. Joe. We all got duped. Agreed? the biggest fraud in the entire history of Pokemon. No, if Jacob knew it was that's like, where it is. That's is where I'm at, right? There's gonna be a whole other process that goes into this. This is this is I would have never purchased this if it wasn't BBC rap. We only buy it because of that. But because of that I felt confident it was legit, it was good. And even though I know that Logan Paul probably has just way, 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 way more money and this doesn't necessarily like devastate him it's hard not to get sick at the thought of losing $3.5 million. But here's the thing, while a lot of tension is gonna be on Matt, on Logan Paul, the, the, the other guy that they showcased that like his story didn't add up, the people possibly most heavily hit from this is gonna be the BBC E. You verified something and it turned out to be a fraud, which is why we saw the BBC E post on their Twitter account today. In March, 2021, we were asked to provide our good faith opinion and verify that the Pokemon case had not been previously opened or tampered with. We evaluated it and in our opinion, the case was in its original state. This past Saturday, we opened that case to verify our opinion and we're extremely disappointed to learn it was inauthentic. We have authenticated tens of thousands of sealed card products for nearly 20 years and have meticulously developed a structure and framework to provide our expert opinion. And then adding, we are reevaluating our approach to all sealed cases going forward. In closing, we have also decided to halt the review of Pokemon or Yu-Gi-Oh cases or boxes until we assess and revise our process to avoid this happening in the future. And so with all that, it would be understandable if you have this community that's, that's concerned if they ever use the BBC. Like if we boil down your business, it comes down to one thing. You are in the trust business and I don't know how you trust after seeing this. Yes, it is very possible this is an outlier, but it is a $3.5 million outlier. To steal something from my seven-year-old, this is a next level oof. But on that happy note, welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Hey, hit that like button if you want me to punch you in the throat and let's just jump into the rest of the news of the day. And then let's talk about why this Michigan judge is under fire right now. So the way the story goes, you have a 72 year old man by the name of Burhan Chowdhury. He's a cancer patient and he was appearing in a hearing via Zoom on Monday after receiving a citation for failing to maintain his yard. And in that hearing, he tried to explain his situation to judge Alexis G. Crott, but uh, take a look at how it went down. Uh, explain what time. I am a cancer patient, very old man. And I am a cancer patient. I was then very weak and this, you sick. You uh, sick. See, uh, very weak. And this time of rainy season, I cannot look look after this thing. Be ashamed of yourself. If I could give you jail time on this, I would. The fine is one hundred dollars. Pay it by February first. You better get that cleaned up. That is totally inappropriate. Oh, no, At this point, the man's son tries to explain the situation himself, saying that he cleaned up the area since then, but the judge seemingly has no sympathy and continues. Clean that up, you sir. See that photo? Yes. I am very sick, man. That is shameful. Shameful. The neighbor <laughs> should not have to look at that. You should be ashamed of yourself. Yes, I am. Yes. With Chowdhury's son later trying to give more context and background to reporters saying that his dad was diagnosed with lymph node cancer back in 2019, struggling with health issues like high blood pressure. Meanwhile, his mother faces health problems after falling down the stairs and hurting her back. With the son saying that he usually helps keep up the yard for his parents, but he couldn't because he had to travel to Bangladesh for three months. Now, the family has since paid the fine, but the son told reporters that he was shocked by the judge's remarks, saying, that's ridiculous. You can't give a 72 year old person jail time for not cleaning an alley. And he is by no means the only person frustrated. People all over the internet labeling the judge's 
rude, heartless, unprofessional. With many saying, no, if anyone should be ashamed in this situation, it's her. Others also arguing that she's too cruel to be a fair judge in any circumstance. You know, for me, I feel like if anything, this story shows me kind of like the, the other side of, you know, every now and then you see on social media, like some feel good story. If we try to attribute it to this, it would be like 72 year old cancer patient, can't do lawn, neighbors come in and help. We all feel good for a second, feel like human beings aren't just fucking horrible to one another. But instead in this situation, we see what happens when people aren't neighborly and unexpectedly nice and they get thrown into a legal system with Judge Karen who seemingly wants to throw people in jail for a bad lawn. I get that it looks bad, but what a fucking weird shitty thing for a person in power to go like, you're gonna have to pay a hundred dollar fine, but I literally wish I could put you in jail. If this case and this situation is any indication, judges like Alexis Krott are the rot in our justice system. And then, you know, new year, same shit. We have Joe Rogan, Spotify, and misinformation in the news again. And this time that's because a group of 270 doctors, scientists, and other medical workers have signed an open letter to Spotify urging the audio platform to implement a misinformation policy with them, specifically citing the Joe Rogan Experience podcast. Right, like I said, this is kind of just the latest thing that we've seen. Over the past year, we've seen a lot of backlash, though also a lot of support. Right, but as far as the backlash over the last year, you had people calling him out for discouraging vaccinations, saying that young people really don't need a vaccine, falsely equating mRNA vaccines to gene therapy, incorrectly stating that vaccines cause supermutations of the virus. With many pointing to the Times, he's repeatedly made other claims against the vaccines, generally downplaying the severity of COVID-19. Most recently, while I was on vacation, he invited Dr. Robert Malone on the show in an episode that's been widely criticized by health experts. With the doctors who signed the letter to Spotify noting that Dr. Malone was actually suspended from Twitter for COVID-19 misinformation, with him adding that he, quote, used the JRE platform to further promote numerous baseless claims, including several falsehoods about COVID-19 vaccines and an unfounded theory that the societal leaders have hypnotized the public. And writing that, notably, Dr. Malone is one of the two recent JRE guests who has compared pandemic policies to the Holocaust. These actions are not only objectionable and offensive, but also medically and culturally dangerous. You also had the medical workers in this open letter, yes, noting Joe's history of touting misinformation himself and adding, by allowing the propagation of false and societal harmful assertions, Spotify is enabling its hosted media to damage public trust in scientific research and so doubt in the credibility of data-driven guidance offered by medical professionals. And continuing, we are calling on Spotify to take action against the mass misinformation events which continue to occur on its platform. With an estimated 11 million listeners per episode, JRE is the world's largest podcast and has tremendous influence. Though Spotify has a responsibility to mitigate the spread of misinformation on its platform, the company presently has no misinformation policy. Right, so looking through this, they're not necessarily asking to remove Joe Rogan entirely or even remove the episode with Dr. Malone, but rather for Spotify to create, have, and follow a misinformation policy on the platform that their users have to follow. With the letter adding that the consequences of this misinformation are real, noting that the average Joe Rogan listener is 24 years old, which puts them in a safer group, but still puts them in an age group that is 12 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID if they're unvaccinated. And with all this, you have one of the doctors who signed this letter, Dr. Katrine Wallace, an epidemiologist at the University of Illinois, Chicago, telling Rolling Stone that Rogan is a quote, menace to public health and addict. These are fringe ideas not backed in science and having it on a huge platform makes it seem there are two sides to this issue and there are really not. But ultimately that is where we are with this story right now. I mean, we can wait and see what happens, but like I said, I think it's a new year, same shit. Because I really don't think we've seen anything from Spotify that seems to signal anything other we're going to let the market decide. Depending on where people stand, uh, people are gonna attribute uh, reasons to why Spotify is doing that. Right? Some that support Rogan and or just Spotify doing this are gonna say, hey, they're defending free speech. Whereas others are gonna say, well, it's just a business showing that dollars lead the day, that they don't care about the impact that misinformation has in the real world. It all comes down to a return on their investment, which they have a massive investment in Joe. But that said, that's a story. And of course, now I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here regarding that last part? Like where do you stand one side, the other, somewhere in the middle? Why, why not? Let me know. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the sponsor of today's show, Noom. Personally for me, using Noom has been less about like some sort of diet and more about helping me develop healthier habits and holding myself accountable for my food and exercise choices. And using it as an excuse with a new year ahead, one of my goals is to stay hydrated and Noom helps me track my water intake, which is work. Right? Instead of just not drinking water until I really need water and then I get a taste of water and then I drink an entire liter of water, which isn't the way to do it, I I've got Noom helping me. Noom is disrupting behaviors and routines using proven psychological and cognitive behavioral therapy practice, like suggesting little changes that turn into huge health improvements in my lifestyle. For instance, Noom suggested adding more of my favorite greens to my meals. I mean, I knew I like broccoli, but uh, let's say recently I found at my age, it is very important to have foods with fiber in my diet just for a, a general stomach reason. Plus, yeah, I'm making healthier choices. I'm also hydrating myself with water-based veggies. So then full circle, I'm on track with my hydration goals. Well, any day can be your day one if right now you're looking for 
a start on your 2022 health and wellness goals, go to Noom.com slash Phil and take Noom's 30 second quiz for free. That's Noom.com slash Phil. And then looking overseas, we should talk about Prime Minister Boris Johnson being just under fire right now. So to bring you up to speed, for the past month and a half, Johnson has been facing severe criticism after it was revealed that he and other Downing Street officials attended parties during the mandated coronavirus lockdown. And specifically, Johnson attended and maybe even hosted a party in May of 2020, right when the lockdowns began. For those who don't remember, during this time, there were no gatherings allowed and people were only allowed to go outside for things like grocery shopping, working out, allowing your silly hair to flutter in the wind. But on a serious note, no matter how you try to spin this, it's a bad look to be partying right after you told the entire nation to stay home. But like any seasoned politician will tell you, it's not always necessarily the scandal that will take you down, but rather the attempt to cover it up. Right? The reason this could really be a problem for Johnson is that after the UK's cabinet office launched an investigation into this matter, staff at Downing Street were allegedly told to clean up their phone just in case and told to get rid of anything that could look bad according to the Independent. And according to a statement from the Information Commissioner's Office, that alone could be a crime depending on the circumstances. With a spokesperson for the agency telling Insider, relevant information that exists in the private correspondence channels of public authorities should be available and included in responses to information requests received. Erasing, destroying, or concealing information within the scope of a freedom of information request with the intention of preventing its disclosure is a criminal offense under Section 77 of the Freedom of Information Act. So if Johnson's office purposefully hid information from an investigation or FOIA request, that could be a serious issue. But also, even if the cabinet inquiry does not find anything wrong with the party itself, there is a chance that an agency like the Information Commissioner could crack down on the alleged efforts to hide information. And hell, let's say somehow these investigations are never conclusive. The Labour Party is already trying to use this as a chance to try and oust Johnson. I mean, take yesterday, for example, you had Johnson trying to apologize for going to the party only for Labour Party leader Keir Starmer to ask if Johnson would resign. The party's over, Prime Minister. The only question is, will the British public kick him out Will his party kick him out? or will he do the decent thing and resign? And so as far as what is going to happen with Johnson, we're gonna have to wait and see. I mean, hell, even before all of this, he and a large number of members of his party not seeing eye to eye on a number of issues. For example, back in December, almost 100 members of his own party voted against a bill that he was pushing through regarding COVID-19 mandates. So yeah, for now, we're gonna ultimately have to wait and see what happens. Though, uh, in general, of course, I'd love to know your thoughts, but especially if you live in the UK, I'd love to know your thoughts around Johnson and everything that's happening right now. And then Prince Andrew's no good, very bad week just got even worse for him. This because the news broke today that he's been stripped of his military titles and his affiliations with numerous charities and organizations. And that announcement regarding Queen Elizabeth's son came just one day after a judge in New York ruled that a sexual abuse lawsuit against him could proceed. With Buckingham Palace saying in a statement this morning, with the Queen's approval and agreement, the Duke of York's military affiliations and royal patronages have been returned to the Queen. The Duke of York will continue not to undertake any public duties and is defending this case as a private citizen. With royal sources also telling reporters that Andrew will no longer use the title His Royal Highness in any official capacity. Which sounds like if anything inside the palace, they're probably calling him he who should not be named. Hell, by next week, maybe Buckingham Palace will be like, Prince Andrew, I, it sounds familiar. Maybe he got a coffee for someone once. But as far as the case at hand, as far as like, you know, the most recent developments, you had Andrew's legal team previously filing a motion to dismiss the civil suit filed against him by Virginia Jufre, who claims that she was trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein and repeatedly forced to perform sex acts with Andrew at the age of 17. Now, Andrew, for his part, has denied those claims, but the most recent thing is that on Wednesday, a judge rejected his team's argument that he was protected from legal jeopardy by terms of a $500,000 settlement between Jufre and Epstein. Which some could say is a weird defense for someone that's like, that didn't happen. But yeah, imagine the pressure on Buckingham Palace and the Queen right now. It has to be massive, right? The Queen has resisted pressure for years now to make such a move, but it appears that it's finally at a point where there, there's not much to do. I mean, even hours before this bombshell announcement, the Queen received a letter from more than 150 military vets saying that it was inconceivable that Andrew maintained his military titles. But yeah, this whole situation and case is gonna be important for us to keep our eyes on. And then the Supreme Court dealt a massive blow to Biden's vaccine mandates today. Are you at the Biden administration trying to use OSHA to push through a mandate for large employers? With the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's emergency measure going into effect on Monday saying that employers with more than 100 workers must require their workers to either get vaccinated or tested every week. And ultimately today in a vote of six to three, the Supreme Court said, nah. Or rather, although Congress has indisputably given OSHA the power to regulate occupational dangers, it has not given that agency the power to regulate public health more broadly. Requiring the vaccination of 84 million Americans selected simply because they work for employers with more than 100 employees certainly falls in the latter category. But it also was not a complete loss for the Biden administration. Because as Axios explained, in its second ruling, the court said that the Biden administration has the authority given by Congress to issue a vaccine mandate for healthcare workers at facilities that receive Medicare or Medicaid funds. With the court saying of these two decisions, the challenges posed by a global pandemic do not allow a federal agency to exercise power that Congress has not conferred upon it. But at the same time, such unprecedented circumstances provide no grounds for limiting the exercise of authorities the agency has long been recognized 
to have. Ultimately, that is where that story and today's show ends. As always, thank you for watching, liking, being subscribed to these daily dives into the news. My name is Philip DeFranco. I love yo faces and I'll see you next time.